Hello again, welcome to another English language A-level video with me, Paul, from the QE here in Darlington. And this is another language change video, and we're looking at international varieties of English. In previous videos, we've looked at L1 English, American English. We've looked at L2 English with a focus on Indian English. And on this one, we're going to have a look at English as a lingua franca and different models of English. So the sorts of task that you might get, certainly on the AQA, paper two, is like that. Evaluate the idea that English is breaking up into many different Englishes. Have a think about that. You might want to pause the video there. Do you totally agree with that? Do you totally disagree? Are you somewhere in the middle? Englishes is an interesting concept. David Crystal would certainly argue very strongly that it's a plural concept. There's no such thing as a, a single English. And you could think about that at a national level across the UK, with the differences between you know, standard English and RP and different varieties of grammar and accent uh, that are going across the country, like Scouse, for example, or Glaswegian. So Englishes, and then you'd need to get stuck into this idea of breaking up. So this prepositional verb, it's a bit pejorative, isn't it? Because it implies fragmentation. And maybe it puts you in mind of one of Gene Aitchison's uh, metaphors describing people's prescriptive concerns about language change. If something is breaking up, then surely it's a bit like uh, the crumbling castle idea. OK, so to what extent do you agree, totally disagree or have mixed feelings? Well, some of the material in this video will have helped you answer that sort of question. Here is some research. So we have some researchers who've come along and tried to describe and give models of different forms of international English. Here is one of the earliest forms. This is produced by somebody called Katru, Branch Katru, and it's called the Three Circles of English. So this was devised in the early 1990s. And there it is, the donut, three circles of English. We have an inner circle, an outer circle, an expanding circle. Now, Catcher is saying that the inner circle here are, you know, speakers in countries like the UK, the US, Australia, New Zealand. So these are native L1 speakers of English. He's describing those as being the inner circle. And he's describing this outer circle as speakers within countries like India, Nigeria, the Philippines, Bangladesh, Pakistan, etc. So L2 speakers of English. And then on the outside here, this is the expanding circle, ever expanding circle. So this is largely speakers who are learning English as their foreign language. So they might be in China or Russia or Japan, etc., etc. OK, and he calls the inner circle, that L1, those L1 speakers as norm providing. So these are the are they are using the varieties by which others are measured, the kind of like standard internationally recognized form of English. He's calling this lot here norm developing. So these are countries in which their own varieties of English are developing. Indian English is different to Nigerian English. And then this third outer expanding circle he calls norm dependent. So this is where English is used for practical purposes rather than for cultural integration. So it's called norm dependent because it's depending upon learning the rules and patterns that are there in the from the L1 users of language. So norm providing, norm developing and norm dependence. Now, it does say on the top criteria when you're writing essays about themes that you need to use the word challenge. So you need to be challenging some of the theories that are being put forward. And there have been challenges of Katru's model. Here are some of the criticisms. First of all, because this was produced in 1992, it precedes the rise of the Internet. And the Internet has changed everything. It certainly blurred the distinction between English users. So that's one criticism. The other criticism is that it doesn't address the diversity of Englishes within the circles. So if you think of that inner circle, it's not differentiating between British English and American English. And you and I know that they are different, very different varieties. So that's one criticism. Another criticism is that it doesn't really address the proficiency of English usage in the outer and expanding circles. So you might have in the expanding circle here, 
Chinese speakers of English who are highly proficient and fluent in the language and others who are much more limited. So this model doesn't really address that. It also doesn't take into account those the gray areas between the circles. And then finally, it seems to be making some kind of implicit value judgment, doesn't it? Because if you're saying these ones here are inner circle users of language, you're suggesting really that they're the true core kind of users of English, that it's better usage than the English that is used in those other circles. OK, so lots of people came along and have challenged that particular model. Tom MacArthur challenged it and came along with a different model in which he puts world standard English at the middle here as a kind of idealized central variety. And it's sort of best represented by written international English. So you've got that in the middle and then you've got your next circle, which is made up of regional standards. OK, so you've got standard and I British and Irish standard English as opposed to American standard English, which is different from Canadian standard English and different from Caribbean standard English. OK, and then finally, you've got this outer layer which kind of consists of localized varieties, which may have similarities with these regional standards, or they may have their own emerging kind of standards. So going to Britain there, you've got the difference between Scottish English and British and English English, I suppose. And within that, of course, you've got your local regional, regional accents and dialects. Okay, so as I said before, challenging these theories is a good thing to do in your essays and this is how some people have challenged tom, tom MacArthur's global english circles uh, so one criticism is that he's put three different types of english i l1 l2 and efl they're conflated together in that second circle and some people would argue, well, that's not good because they're very, very different types of English that are being used. Um, he's missed out the kind of multitude of Englishes in Europe. Uh, and thirdly, this outside layer contains things like pigeons, creoles and L2 Englishes. Well, most scholars would argue that actually English pigeons and English creoles, they don't belong to the same family. So if you think of pidgin languages, these are very minimalist, stripped down contact languages between usually vernacular, so not written, but spoken. And they're, so they're used by people who have very restricted uh, knowledge of that contact language. And the next generation that comes along, whose parents perhaps spoke pidgin, they develop a creole. So a fully elaborate language that has kind of been spawned from uh, an original pidgin language. Okay, so what uh, the criticism here is that most scholars would argue that actually pigeons and creoles, they don't really belong to the same family. Okay, so what about elf? I'm not talking about the film, I'm talking about the language. So this is uh, lingua franca. What is it? Well, a lingua franca is a language that's used between speakers who have no common language between them. So it's used to enable communication for purposes such as trade. And so lingua franca is they're built on a base language um, and that tends to be a global language uh, such as English. Now don't think of English as being the only lingua franca. I mean, throughout history, there have been all sorts of different lingua franca. The noun phrase itself, lingua franca, comes from French. So Swahili, Arabic, French, Spanish, Hindi, Portuguese, and several others, they're all used in this way, but maybe now to a much lesser extent. There's a video here with a good explanation about what is a lingua franca. One of the prime movers in this is Jennifer James. Uh, sorry, Jennifer Jenkins uh, from the University of Southampton. Uh, she's done a lot of work on uh, ELF, so it's worth looking at her video there on YouTube, an introduction to English as a lingua franca. Her point is that ELF usage may include local varieties of English features, so it's not just correct standard forms of English that you're gonna get, it's gonna be heavily influenced 
by local varieties. And she also makes the point that you know, ELF users um, do linguistic accommodation. So they converge and diverge just like uh, L1 speakers do. And they code switch. Okay. But there are a certain number of kind of common, typical, identifiable features that you're going to see in ELF. They are uh, named here in the textbook. So let's have a look at them. Uh, in terms of grammatical verb usage, uh, inflections, you often get the dropping of the third person present simple S. So instead of saying he teaches English, which would be British Standard English, you, can, you would often hear he teach English. So that's the dropping of the third person present simple S inflection. You also get interchangeability of these relative pronouns, right? She is the student which is learning English, or she is the student who is learning English. So interchangeability of those relative pronouns. Other things uh, are about uh, articles. Uh, quite often, lots of languages don't have articles or don't use articles in the same way, whereas English has the definite article, the and indefinite articles. At and at. So it's often in ELF, you often get either the omission or the insertion of definite and indefinite articles, which makes it different to British Standard English. You also get uh, what's known as unchanging tag questions. So uh, things like phrases like isn't it or no put on the end of statements to make them into tag questions. Uh, prepositions, take a close look at those. These are those small words that tell you the relative position of one thing to another, like to, from, in, under. So different prepositional usage is a feature of ELF. And you also get in terms of verbs, quite a lot of these sorts of verbs like do, have, make, put, take. So verbs of high semantic generality, kind of all purpose generic verbs being used in all sorts of situations. And then finally, you get explicit statements where one of the things in the phrase you, you might say as a, as a British standard English speaker is a bit redundant. So black colour, for example, do you need the word colour in there? How long time do you need the word time in there? So that's often a feature of ELF speech. OK, so let's now focus on a particular case study. Uh, we're going to take you to the to Far East, to Singapore. This is a variety, an interesting variety of English. So there it is, Singapore, just above Indonesia, uh, below Malaysia. And we're going to do it in conjunction with another model of English. This is devised by somebody called Schneider, and he devised a model to illustrate how colonization processes shape international varieties of English. And he claims that there are kind of five uh, processes to this. Let's go through them in order. So phase one is your foundation. So this is where English is brought to a territory by a colonizing power leading to an emerging bilingualism. I'll just read to you the explanation for this from the textbook, and then I'll show you an example from Singapore. So foundation, colonial expansion and trade resulting to results in the initial spread of English worldwide. And in the early stages, bilingualism is slow to spread with some lexical borrowings to aid simple communications. OK, so in the case of Singapore, we've got in the early 19th century, we've got the British, of course, establishing a trading post on the island of Singapore. And so the population grows, you get the arrival of Chinese and Indian immigrants. So this is the foundation process of Schneider's dynamic model of post-colonial English. You then go into what he calls exonormative stabilisation, which is a heck of a mouthful. And exonormative stabilisation means an elite bilingualism spreads and it's led by the politically dominant power. So this is the idea that the politically dominant country determines the linguistic behaviour. English is established as the, as the language of law and administration and education. OK, so this is what happens in Singapore. British English becomes considered the kind of prestigious standard form and it's associated with education, culture and progress. OK, so it's called exonormative because it's looking back towards British English as the kind of standard that everybody should be trying to achieve. 
exonormative stabilization. You then move into nativization of Schneider's model. This is stage three. So this is where bilingual speakers forge a new variety of English as ties with settlers' countries of origin weaken. So the settlers establish themselves in a new environment, um, inter-ethnic contact, contact increases, a new variety of English develops. And of course, conservative speakers might resent this kind of innovation, but other speakers begin to adopt some local forms. So you've got a new form of English that develops in Singapore. So for example, you get the use of these particles, words like ah and la, as in wait ah, or hurry la, I need to go now. So this is part of the nativization process the forging of a new variety of English. We then go move into the fourth stage, and this is called endonormative stabilization. Okay, so this is where a new linguistic norm is established and codified. Notice it's endonormative, so it's looking within itself. Phase two was exonormative because it was looking back towards Britain for standard English. This is endonormative. So what you're getting is the establishment of different forms of English in Singapore. You're getting Singaporean acrolect. So on the acrolect, there is really no significant and consistent difference from you know, standard British English. So for many, that's considered prestigious still. That's the Singaporean acrolect. Then you've got a mesolect, and this has some features which are distinct from standard British English. And here's some examples. You might get question tenses in an indirect form. So may I ask, where is the toilet? Rather than the, than the inversion that you get in standard British English, of, may I ask where the toilet is? Okay, you would maybe get indefinite article deletion. Uh, may I apply for car license? Instead of may I apply for a car license? And you may get a lack of uh, verb marking as well. So he always go to the shopping center. OK, so the lack of the S, third person, present simple S inflection on the end of the verb. So this is called a mesolect. It's kind of halfway house between an acrolect and the final one, which is the basilect, which is the furthest away from British Standard English. OK, and you might call the singlish. So a, a tag question such as is it so uh, you're coming today, is it? And consistent copular verb deletion. The copular verb is the verb to be, so missing out the verb to be. My handwriting not good, la, instead of the British Standard English, my handwriting isn't good, la. Okay, so three different levels. And these things that I'm talking about, acrolect, mesolect, and basilect, they're not just special to Singapore. You know, we could describe all sorts of languages having those different levels. This is Schneider's fourth phase, endonormative stabilization. And then finally, you're moving into what he's calling differentiation. So this is where varieties emerge. So in different parts of the country, you know, you've got different varieties of English which emerge. Okay, and so you've got internal diversity uh, and if you go to your textbook, uh, have a look on page 301, is it? Let's see if I can find it. Yes, you've got this article, which is called Speak Like a Singaporean. And that's really interesting because it gives you 10 different words or phrases which you might find handy on your Singapore holiday. So these are varieties of English which are specific to this ELF. Okay. So there you are, that's given you some of the models for describing international forms of English. And in our next video, we will be looking in a bit more close detail at the kind of lexical and grammatical features of English as a lingua franca. Thank you very much.